Heals welcomes you to the third Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. Heals is the largest non-governmental organization in Europe promoting and advocating scientific research into longevity and biogerontology. Thanks to generous support from our sponsors, Heals was able to organize this conference. The conference will highlight the cutting edge of knowledge in the field of biogerontology and provide a unique opportunity for researchers, government officials, biotech executives and advocates from around the world to meet, network and forge new scientific collaborations. Good afternoon. Uh, it's the first time that I give a lecture with, on, with music on the background. So, <laughs> uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a good topic. Uh, we will talk about exercise, so uh, maybe we can dance. Um, so my, um, my home university is, uh, is here in Brussels, um, the Dutch-speaking uh, Free University of Brussels. Um, and I'm in charge of a research group on frailty and aging. And we are focusing our research on um, the um, effects of uh, exercise on uh, the inflammatory uh, profile in all the persons. And so I will present you today uh, um, some results of our recent work, uh, some uh, things that were recently published and also some uh, uh, not yet published uh, data. So I have no uh, disclosures. Um, so as you, you know, uh, um, um, aging is accompanied with uh, um, balances and disbalances uh, between pro and anti-inflammatory signaling. Um, I used this slide, I could have used another uh, figure by uh, um, Claudio Francesi who was here in the room uh, just a, a minute ago. Um, but uh, um, in general uh, what we see is that uh, when older persons uh, show a, a higher uh, degree of uh, pro-inflammatory uh, signaling that um, this leads to let's say um, worse uh, aging and uh, reduced uh, life expectancy. So uh, these people develop uh, or are more prone to age-related diseases and to develop frailty. Whereas those uh, uh, individuals who age uh, with a, a proper balance between pro and anti-inflammatory signaling, they seem to um, age better and uh, survive better. And so um, uh, the idea is that um, well, when, uh, when people age, um, there are uh, different uh, problems that occur in different domains. As you see, uh, there is muscle wasting, there's cognitive decline, there's mortality, uh, chronic diseases. And um, uh, we know that uh, inflammation is one of the key um, uh, pathophysiological pathways involved in all of these uh, different uh, systems. Um, of course, inflammation is not the sole uh, um, uh, pathway, but it, is, it seems to be strongly involved in all these uh, changes and uh, um, well, exercise seems to be a, a good or a proper uh, intervention to uh, let's say cut through these uh, uh, these different uh, uh, effects uh, of inflammation and so uh, to um, uh, improve uh, aging and to reduce the burden uh, that occurs with aging. And so, one might question: How how does it work? How can exercise actually um, combat inflammation uh, in aging and well there has been uh, uh, quite uh, quite some research being done um, the pioneers in this uh, in this uh, domain are in Copenhagen uh, it's a, the group of uh, Bente Peterson um, actually we have a postdoc who will work there uh, for a few months and um, uh, I will try to explain you how uh, we think that it works and uh, uh, what what evidence we have uh, till now so here you see one of our participants uh, exercising on a strength training machine. Um, I will focus today more uh, on uh, muscle uh, training because uh, it's an interesting um, type of exercise because it combats um, uh, muscle weakness and muscle atrophy that occurs in aging and we know also that it has some uh, anti-inflammatory effects. So I will focus today on uh, strength training. So she will exercise, so she is uh, uh, pushing weight uh, on the machine. Uh, she still looks good. Huh? And while she is exercising, in fact, uh, there are some um, small signaling molecules that are um, uh, produced and released from the myocytes into the bloodstream. There are some, they, they call them myokines, and uh, there are 
there's a long, long list of myokines that has been described. And um, uh, on the one hand, you have myokines that uh, are produced by the cell and stay in the cell or very close to the muscle cell and have some kind of autocrine or paracrine signaling uh, effect. But also myokines that um, have a, a stronger signaling function on uh, other organs and have a more endocrine effect. And I will focus today on these, uh, these last um, a category of, uh, of cytokines. And so what happens, um, so here we have a, a timeline and each time that you see a green arrow, there is a, an exercise session. And so during exercise, um, there is a strong release of uh, different uh, myokines. And unfortunately, the contrast in this room doesn't allow you to see so much. But I'll explain you. So this, this red, um, this red signal here is um, uh, representing the release of or the occurrence of um, uh, IL-6 in the bloodstream. So interleukin-6, it's, it's a pleiotropic cytokine, can have pro- and anti-inflammatory signaling functions depending on the uh, situation when it is released. And during exercise, IL-6 has in fact a um, metabolic signaling function. So we know that uh, IL-6 um, gets released from the muscle when the muscle gets exhausted. So that's a key element uh, necessary to, uh, to induce this IL-6 response. And uh, in fact, uh, IL-6 will uh, signal uh, in, uh, in the liver um, the need for more energy and will, uh, will, will, will release the, uh, thank you, the glycogen reserves from the liver uh, into the bloodstream. Um, there are some very nice experiments that have demonstrated this, uh, this pathway. Um, and uh, also, um, if uh, people drink, for instance, um, uh, glu glucose uh, drinks during their exercise, uh, the IL-6 uh, response is completely blunted. So um, it can also uh, figure what you should drink or should not drink during exercise. But anyway, so IL-6 is released as a, as a metabolic uh, uh, signaling function, but uh, IL-6 is also interfering with uh, the immune system, and it is supposed that uh, IL-6, uh, when released during exercise, will stimulate the um, uh, peripheral mono mononuclear cells like monocytes, lymphocytes, um, to trigger them and to uh, produce anti-inflammatory cytokines like uh, interleukin-10, interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, which is in fact inhibiting uh, IL-1-beta, uh, soluble TNF receptors, which are also capturing TNF-alpha and making, making it uh, um, an uh, inactive. And also a brain-derived neurotrophic factor is being released. So this, uh, this is being washed out after about 24 hours after exercise. And so then it's time to exercise again. Uh, and so each time uh, there is an exercise bout with this acute effect. Well, uh, on the long term, um, we, uh, we hypothesize that, uh, in fact, these uh, um, bouts of anti-inflammatory signaling following these uh, acute IL-6 uh, increases will lead to um, a change in balance between pro- and anti-inflammatory signaling in the body and would reverse uh, the low-grade inflammatory profile. So people would merge from a more um, pro-inflammatory profile towards a more anti-inflammatory profile and might, by this effect, have a beneficial effects on uh, aging. Now, um, when, uh, when the, the effects of exercise on the acute release of IL-6 has been described, uh, uh, it was uh, being published in the field of the uh, exercise immunologists and people thought that it was something that occurs only in young people doing a very high uh, sports exercise like running a marathon or um, uh, competing a triathlon. Um, we were one of the first uh, uh, who showed that uh, strength training, so resistance training in older persons, also um, enables an uh, acute IL-6 response. And so, um, we, we trained uh, all the adults uh, for about uh, 30 to 45 minutes on uh, strength training devices. And we did it in both in an untrained condition and in a trained condition. So this is before and after one session in untrained condition where people were quite naive to the exercise. And uh, here people were trained uh, uh, during six weeks on the training machines. And so as you can see, this uh, IL-6 response remains uh, remains present uh, also when people are trained. So it's not an artifact. It's not due to the fact that people are, um, are, are mishandling their body, for instance. Um, interestingly, regarding IL-10, we saw that the 
um, uh, the acute response of IL-10 uh, seemed to improve in trained condition compared to untrained conditions. So it is already a very small indication towards uh, validation of the hypothesis. Now in this, uh, this figure, um, you see an overview of all studies that we found. <laughs> I don't claim that this is uh, comprehensive, but we think that we found pretty uh, much of the literature. All studies that investigated the effects of strength training on um, uh, inflammatory markers in young subjects and in older persons, both after acute uh, exercise and effects on the longer term. And as you can see, there are plenty of uh, cytokines that have been investigated. Also here we added uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And um, so th there are still plenty of gray zones in this uh, map. And um, uh, even in, the, in those cells where there, are, where there is more uh, research done, so each arrow represents one study, uh, you see that there is also um, there are conflicting results. Uh, some studies indicate uh, a diminution of uh, IL-6 on the longer term after exercise and other studies indicate no significant effects. Uh, also the um, uh, acute and long-term effects um, are uh, uh, sometimes opposite, which can be um, <coughs> normal of course. So is there um, maybe a dose response relationship that can explain this discrepancy in the literature or the gender or sex related uh, effects that might um, uh, explain this discrepancy? Uh, well, we, we went into uh, these elements in our studies. And um, uh, as you know, uh, you can st strengthen your muscles in, in different ways. Um, the most investigated uh, type of exercise is uh, an exercise that uh, 70 to 80 percent of the maximal resistance. Uh, so it means that your muscle is fatigued after 10 to 12 repetitions. Um, then you have to rest because you cannot lift the weight anymore. And then you can do a second, uh, second um, bout of exercise. Uh, this is what is called the traditional high intensity exercise. But it's also possible to reduce the uh, resistance. So to work with less heavy weight, but at that moment uh, you are supposed to, uh, to lift much more times uh, uh, the weight. And there, in, in that kind of research, there are there's many di discrepancies between the exercise protocols uh, that have been studied. And so we try to uh, unravel some elements. Uh, well, um, what are the, the chronic effects of exercise on the inflammatory um, uh, profile? So here uh, we studied the classical uh, progressive uh, strength training uh, uh, program. So three times 10 repetitions at 80% of the one repetition maximum, which is really heavy, heavy weight, it's difficult, it's, um, it, it's heavy. Um, these uh, subjects, they trained for 12 weeks and uh, we did a, a matched control uh, study. Uh, so we had uh, uh, volunteers for the exercise uh, intervention and we matched them with uh, control subjects with the same age, same gender and the same um, comorbidity, so the same um, uh, comorbid profile in order to exclude that element. So what we saw is that in the uh, intervention group we saw a decrease in uh, interleukin-6 after 12 weeks training whereas in the control group there was no real um, significant effect had been seen. However, our study might have been a little bit underpowered because the difference in changes was not uh, significant. But it indicates that even in, in subjects with normal comorbidities that, that occur uh, in, in everyday people, uh, that exercise can reduce uh, inflammatory signaling. Here we went uh, a step further, and um, this is in fact it's, uh, these are first results of an ongoing study. Um, where we uh, investigated uh, 12 weeks of uh, resistance training on uh, different types of resistance training, uh, the intensive strength training regimen, which is again the classical high intensity strength training, uh, three times 10 repetitions, 80% of the uh, one repetition maximum. And we compared it with uh, strength endurance training, which uh, consists in two times or two series of 30 repetitions at half of the resistance uh, that was used in the intensive training group. So um, in th these two groups, um, by the end of their training, they lifted the same amount of total weight 
but the second group did it in much more repetitions compared to the first group. And then the control group was a, a flexibility training group because these subjects also trained their muscles, but in a passive way. And so uh, our hypothesis is that if you train the muscles in a passive way, there is no um, myokine uh, release. But it's a good uh, placebo. So as you can see here, um, we looked at um, the changes uh, after uh, three months in female and in male uh, uh, subjects. And uh, uh, well, in the female subjects, we didn't see uh, any uh, significant uh, change, whereas in the male subjects, we saw a significant reduction in IL-6, again, in this intensive strength training group, uh, which is particularly interesting. Uh, so it seems to be a, a gender effect, so a sex effect, but also a, a training effect uh, that, um, that is observed here. Now, this study is still ongoing. We hear this is based on only 113 uh, subjects. Uh, we are still recruiting. We are now at about uh, 180 uh, subjects. So we will hopefully um, uh, come up with a, with a paper very soon. Um, in another study, uh, we compared uh, uh, diff again different types of strength training. And uh, we again played with the dose uh, of the training. And uh, again, we have here a first group with the traditional uh, high-intensity strength training group. And then we compared it with uh, two types of low-intensity um, uh, training group. So um, this group, the low group, they performed uh, one series of 80 to 100 repetitions, but at only 20% of the maximum weight that they can lift. So I, I did myself also all these uh, ex exercises to, to feel what it does. And uh, in this type of training, you really have to switch a button in your head because uh, 100 repetitions is boring. Uh, and so, but it's feasible. It's, 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 it's not unfeasible. And then the, the low plus group is a hybrid group. It's a combination of both. So first, um, uh, the subject performs one set of 60 repetitions at 20% of the one repetition maximum. And then without rest, we just double the weight. And we ask them to continue until uh, fatigue occurs. Um, and then usually they are able to perform 10 to 20 repetitions um, on top of these uh, 60 repetitions at low intensity. And so what we saw is uh, when we look at uh, overall effects, um, when all groups are merged together, we saw that um, uh, the strength training uh, interventions, they can increase uh, the um, concentration of uh, soluble TNF receptor 1 and IL-8 uh, after 12 um, weeks training, which is in fact um, in favor for an, uh, an anti-inflammatory signaling. Uh, IL-8 is known uh, in, in non-pathological conditions to improve vascularization, so it can, it's probably it has a, a positive effect. Um, and also strength and muscle mass improved in these subjects. So we believe that uh, the increase in IL-8 is not a pro-inflammatory signaling, but rather a, a positive signaling. And when we look more closely into the uh, gender and, um, uh, and, and, and type of exercise effects, we saw again that uh, the, the most effects were, saw, were seen in um, the uh, high intensity training group, which is uh, really interesting here. Uh, so the male subjects seem to respond better than the female, and um, especially the high intensity groups uh, showed a significant effect in these males for IL-8 and IL-1 RA. Now, um, what about the effects on uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is a very important um, um, uh, growth factor for, um, for neurons, and is believed to be involved in the exercise-induced positive effects on cognition in uh, older persons. Um, well, most, most body of knowledge on BDNF is based on aerobic training. There are not so many studies performed in older persons uh, with resistance training. Um, so I think that here, we, again, we provide some kind of interesting uh, information. Um, here we did, uh, um, uh, we come back to our first study, uh, we investigated here also the um, uh, BDNF, and we saw no effect uh, of 12-week uh, strength training, high-intensity strength training on uh, BDNF. We also separated for male and female, we, we saw nothing, uh, no effects. But when we uh, compare our different types of strength training uh, regimens, so the high, the low, plus, and the low, um, we see other uh, subgroups popping up. 
uh, compared to the effects on the uh, uh, inflammatory signaling. So on BDNF, it seems that the male again, they respond uh, better after a low plus uh, strength training program. And the low plus strength training program, as you remember, this was this one, the hybrid uh, strength training program. And probably since there are much more repetitions being performed, but still at an intensity sufficiently high to really trigger the, um, uh, the myokine response, uh, uh, probably this is, comes a little bit more closely to what is seen in aerobic training um, and uh, has here a positive effect on uh, BDNF after uh, 12 weeks training and we, we went a step further here uh, after 24 weeks detraining we uh, we also uh, sampled blood of these participants and we saw that in these male participants well uh, BDNF dropped back to baseline levels which means that uh, yeah there is an effect after 12 weeks but you need to continue to train to maintain that uh, that effect probably because if you stop training you um, drop back to uh, baseline um, levels so in order to, um, to conclude or to summarize um, uh, the work that we have done till now uh, on that topic, uh, resistance training in older persons uh, shows uh, health benefits. It has been well documented uh, uh, by, by, by many authors. Uh, there are uh, systematic reviews uh, available on that topic. Um, and uh, we think that uh, systemic and immunological pathways are involved. Uh, and um, when interpreting the literature, one should take care to um, uh, look at sex differences and those response relationships in order to uh, properly interpret uh, the body of evidence. And our recommendations are uh, to propose sufficient exercise volume and intensity and uh, to vary the type of exercise because one type of exercise might be, have a positive effect on muscle mass and, for instance, inflammation, but might have less effects on other uh, beneficial uh, signaling pathways. So probably variation is physiologically the best way, but also psychologically in order to continue uh, exercise on the longer term, variation is always a good idea. Um, I think that although we are still exploring some pathways, uh, that there, there is evidence available and we should uh, prioritize implementation of uh, these exercises. Um, I want to acknowledge some people from my, my group and other groups who contributed to these uh, studies that I presented. And um, I'm open for questions. Thank you for your lecture. Okay, questions? My wife uh, is uh, exercising, and uh, she told me that uh, has a lot of benefit. But I saw in your slide that uh, female are resistant uh, to uh, to to improve with exercise. So. <laughs> what <laughs> what do you think about? <laughs> I, well, we we don't have a, a, a real explanation uh, why we didn't see the same effects in uh, female than in male. Um, regarding the BDNF, there is some some hypothesis that uh, um, BDNF can can be is probably related also to the effects on testosterone and that there can be an interaction. Uh, which might explain why uh, in female there is... I have uh, another, another um, hypothesis. Okay. <laughs> Maybe... So we, we, we have data in a, Euro, in a European study showing that uh, at that age, uh, women and men have a totally different body composition. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding both the lean and the, the fat mass. So this could be very interesting. So the, the different organs could participate in a different way to the, to the benefit. Mm. Because I, both benefit, mm. but uh, mm. maybe these cytokines and the myokines, uh, they, they can be different uh, according to the body composition. I agree, uh, because uh, one, one, uh, one organ that I didn't, or one cell type that I didn't mention are the adipocytes, which are probably uh, also important um, to take into account regarding effects of exercise on inflammation. Um, you can check a deep, um, uh, uh, the other. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and probably, yeah. probably w one step that we could, uh, could go further into, uh, we have not yet done it. Is to connecting, for example. Yes, or, or to normalize the effects regarding to the muscle mass uh, of, exactly. this, of the participants. Exactly. That's something that we could look into to and see whether uh, we, we find an effect. Yes.
Thank you. Um, before showing your um, different uh, exercises, you had shown a table. Could you go back to it? A, a sort of gray and uh, green table, which was very interesting. Uh, because it showed that in uh, the aged population, uh, this one, yes, uh, you have um, in uh, acute, as acute response in the older persons, um, this uh, <laughs> acting of the uh, intracellular and vascular cell adhesion molecules, selectins, MCP1, and so on, which are the guys who fulfill the orders of the cytokines, as you know, because they recruit leukocytes. So, in fact, it's quite fascinating to see that in a young person, all this um, uh, war uh, uh <laughs> panoplia is not responding, whereas in an aged uh, person, it's massively responding. So I wonder what's your interpretation about this? It's like a young person does not need even uh, cytokines because anyway, he's okay or she. Uh, whereas uh, uh, it's very interesting, the acute response in uh, the older persons. What do you think? Uh, uh, two things. Um, uh, first, um, uh, and, and, and that's one of our publications which is still, still submitted at this moment um, in younger subjects. So we also did an experiment in younger subjects comparing high and low intensity strength training. And we saw positive effect on, um, on, so on, on the basal levels also in the young people. Uh, following strength training. So we saw a beneficial effect on uh, um, uh, soluble TNF receptor 1 and uh, IL-1 RA. Um, so also young people can benefit from it. Um, the second, um, uh, why here? Well, the discrepancy or the link between the acute and the long-term effects in this table, um, I'm a little bit hesitating to fully interpret it because uh, uh, these data come from different studies, different cohorts, and uh, most often also uh, using different types of uh, exercise regimens. Um, and so um, in order to, to give you a proper explanation, um, uh, I, I should come back uh, <laughs> next year and, uh, and, 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 and report you on, on an ongoing study where we are in fact linking acute effects to long-term effects, uh, but this necessitates uh, a completely different uh, uh, um, methodology, of course, and um, um, I, I'm not sure that in the young uh, subjects that uh, uh, the acute effects are, are um, less apparent. Uh, in fact, I, I think that uh, given the uh, immunosenescence uh, that is seen in all the subjects, that um, their immune response, their acute immune response, and also their chronic immune response might even be blunted compared to uh, the young ones. Although this table doesn't uh, yes, give evidence table, for this it. This table doesn't uh, give evidence for that. <laughs> give but evidence for that because, no. you know, you have a huge anti-inflammatory effect. I just take the column of the acute in the older persons. You have a huge anti-inflammatory effect on the cytokines there. And then you have a pro-inflammatory effect if you look at all the executors of the order. So you don't understand what's going on. They have less TNF and they have more ICAM-1. It's just an open question. I yeah. don't want to... Yeah. Uh, no, 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 just no, 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 uh, interesting no, no, no. because no, no. it's yes, a yes, paradox. Yes, yes. Well, uh, regarding TNF, you see that most studies, so there are four studies, only one saw an increase in TNF and uh, one study saw a significant decrease and two studies didn't see any any change, yeah, TNF is very yeah. difficult to yeah. measure. And it's you don't difficult have to, to look measure at TNF. in the, in, in, in the no, uh, no. circulation. No, no. Uh, but when we look into, uh, well, f uh, for the acute uh, pro inflammatory, well, CRP, for instance, mm. uh, well, again, there is no overwhelming evidence for pro inflammatory response. Yeah, but when you CRP look at the IL 6, yes, yes, but the IL 6, in, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in my talk, I don't believe that IL-6 has a pro-inflammatory signaling in, the, in, in this case. It has a metabolic signaling. And uh, it I agree, yes. And, and, and it engages a secondary side effect, which is anti-inflammatory, uh, which, uh, which is um, mediating these long-term effects, uh, pointing towards decreases in this pro-inflammatory signaling in, in, in basal 
situations, not directly after exercise. Okay, thank you very much.